Good morning, everyone. This is Michelle Scott with the California Healthcare Interpreting Association. Welcome to this webinar, Turning Your Thermostat Down, Preserving Emotional and Physical Energy When Vicarious Trauma Sets In, with psychologist Diane Moradian. This webinar is part of our new monthly webinar series offered by the CHIA Education Committee. I will be hosting today's webinar, and first let's review a few items. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted to CHIA's YouTube channel immediately following the webinar. So feel free to share the YouTube link with your colleagues, and of course, if you want to watch it again, you can. And I'm going to show you the YouTube channel now. There are actually two YouTube channels that we have uh, for CHIA. One has some videos on it from about five years ago, and this is our new channel. So in order to watch these webinars, you want to make sure that you look at the one that says new. If you look at the home page, and you can look for this nice picture here of our interpreters from the, the 2014 uh, CHIA conference. Uh, when you look at it here, you won't see any videos. You do have to click on videos, and you will see the, the four of the webinars that we've had. Uh, and uh, there will be some more videos as well that we'll, we will eventually have up on our site. And if you click on playlists, then you can see that there is a playlist for Chia webinars as well as a new playlist. There's only one video there right now, but uh, we will continue adding to it. And this is resource videos. So basically, whenever uh, presenters are referring to videos that are on YouTube, we will post links there. And I do want to encourage everyone to click the subscribe button, uh, that nice little red subscribe button when you do go to the YouTube channel. Uh, we'd like to try to get, uh, you know, at least 20 more subscribers today after today's webinar. Um, so help us to reach that goal. And when you subscribe to the YouTube channel, that means that every time we put up a video, you would be notified that that's up there. And you'll know then that there's new, new content on our, on our site, on our channel. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance for this webinar, you need to remain connected to the webinar for the entire presentation. Uh, we cannot issue certificates to anyone who has attended just a portion of the webinar, and we also cannot issue certificates for anybody who's watching the recording um, on YouTube. If you are only calling in by phone, that's another way that we cannot issue a certificate. The webinar platform simply does not allow us to track your attendance, so you do need to sign on. If you have any trouble with he hearing the audio at any point, though, that's when you can call into the phone number and use your phone for audio. We will issue certificates by CHIA, uh, not the trainer, and do please allow us about 30 days to process the certificates. The CHIA Education Committee is made up of volunteers, and so we do appreciate your, your patience in allowing us to process um, the, the large number of certificates that we have uh, for each of these trainings. And with that in mind, we are always looking for volunteers for the Education Committee, and you can contact us at info at chiaonline.org if you are interested in working on the CHIA Education Committee. There is a questions box uh, where you can submit on the webinar platform where you can submit any questions or comments that you have for the trainer. I will be moderating those. She will not be looking at those herself, but I will moderate those so that um, you will uh, be able to have uh, her answer your question. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end. But you can put your questions and comments online at any time that you'd like. And we do welcome your feedback for the webinar. You're going to have two options to complete a survey at the end of today's training. The first is that you will have a survey will pop up on your screen immediately following the webinar. And the second is that you'll have an email uh, tomorrow, follow, one day following the webinar, with a link to the survey. Even if you thought, uh, complete the survey on your screen, you're still going to get the email tomorrow. So it, just disregard it. Uh, but if you don't have a chance to do it now, just to let you know you will receive that link. We invite you to use the hashtag ChiaWebinar if you're posting about today's event. Uh, we do hope that you'll let people know on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, anything you want, any social media form that you use. We hope that you will share that you are watching today's webinar, Chia webinar. 
And today it is my great pleasure to introduce today's trainer. Diane Moradian has a master's in psychology and is a certified Hudson Institute coach. She conducts bilingual clinical work in the areas of addiction, domestic violence, and childhood trauma. And she has an extensive background in personal management of thousands of interpreters worldwide. She also has herself experience as an interpreter. So this is a tremendous uh, uh, dual power. She's got superhero powers <laughs> in the interpreting world, which is wonderful. Thank you, Diane. Uh, and uh, it, it really helps to have that experience as an interpreter and a clinician uh, to be able to work with people that are, that are in this field. I can tell everyone today that I had the pleasure of listening to Diane present at Chia's 2015, I'm sorry, 2016 conference uh, in uh, Long Beach this year. And uh, it is, it is as you will see, that she has uh, extensive knowledge and, and an ability to connect and understand the issues that interpreters are facing. So um, together that with her clinical work, um, I, I think you'll see that this is an extremely important topic um, and one that we need to remind our colleagues, uh, for those of you who have colleagues that are not joining us today, we need to remember uh, that as much as it's important to have terminology and other skills-based training, our self-care is incredibly important, and that's what Diane is going to talk about today, because without taking care of ourselves, none of the rest of it matters. So with that, Diane, I am going to, oh, actually, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to also show everybody the website, the Chia website, but I'll, I'll go back to that at the end. Um, so I'm going to switch over to Diane now and let her uh, start her presentation. Well, wonderful. Thank you uh, very much, Michelle. I appreciate it. Uh, and it's wonderful to uh, be with, with you here this morning. Uh, and it was, it was sharing with Michelle uh, that I had a little bit of uh, anxiety this morning when I was getting ready for, uh, to do the presentation. Uh, it's been a while since I've worked from home. I did work from home for several years as a, an over-the-phone interpreter, so I was very, very used to uh, making sure that my home environment was uh, appropriately set up so there wouldn't be any uh, an ambient noise in the house. So I was rushing around, closing windows, uh, turning off <laughs> turning off the phone, I actually put up a, a sign on my front door so no one would knock while I was here. So it took me back uh, to the to the years that I worked as an, an OPI interpreter. So it, it kind of made me chuckle that you know we, we don't forget the things that that we that we've done in our past. Uh, but I'm very excited to be here this morning, and I want to make sure, Michelle, can you see what you're supposed to see on the screen? Yes, it's just perfect. Okay, you don't see, like, the, the side panel that I can see with all the bars? I do not. Oh, beautiful. Okay, great. So with that, and this particular topic is very, uh, is very important to me. Uh, I, I had never really heard the term vicarious trauma before. Probably it's something that I actually heard of, like the phrase, I would say within the last maybe 10 years. Uh, but that being said, I always knew that, that the experiences that I was having, uh, you know, working um, as an interpreter, you know, I worked as a community interpreter for uh, several years, and then I worked as an over-the-phone interpreter for several years, I always knew that those experiences were having an impact on me. I, I just didn't know what the, the phrase was uh, or that I guess the, the name of the experience was. So now that I you know, have moved uh, into sort of a different field of work, I, I actually am able to tie a, tie a title, let's say, to the experience, which I always think is nice because it kind of validates what I know I'm feeling uh, and it makes it easier uh, to to talk to people about about the experience uh, as like in, within a framework. So before we get started in, in me talking to you, I'd like to ask you to to think about uh, a, a certain set of questions. 
Now, here we are, Michelle, having our first probably technical difficulty. Um, I'm trying to advance the screen, and it's not the slide's not moving. Michelle? I am here. You're right. I don't see it moving. It, there's, I'm not sure that that is not a webinar issue. Are you doing it from your PowerPoints, not from the uh, you know, panel? I am. Let's see. Let me just close this. Wait one second. I'm going to bring this back up here. So while she's doing that, well, to let everybody know, we, so sorry. we do we do <laughs> little rehearsals every time, <laughs> but it seems every time there's a little something new that comes up. And we did two rehearsals. We did. So let's see if this works. Okay. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Can you see the, the slide? Okay. So wonderful. So. This is a, uh, an opportunity for you to uh, share some feedback with us in terms of what your perception is about what constitutes trauma. Um, before we talk about vicarious trauma, I wanted to take a step back and set the groundwork of what constitutes trauma. So we have a poll question that we'd like you to uh, participate in. And Michelle, if you want to um, talk about how people can vote, um, I, this is this is really not a test. It's just for us to get a sense of what your perception is of which situations are uh, traumatic, and that you can only vote on uh, a subset of the list that I that I um, that I actually have that I'll share with you. So let's take a minute and uh, to share with us your feedback about which situations you think uh, might constitute trauma. So we've got the poll launched here, and we've got uh, a number of you already responding. As Diane said, we couldn't put all of the options, but we do have the choices which situations are traumatic, domestic violence, community crime, death, natural disaster, and a, a medical or mental health condition. So we've got about three quarters of you have voted so far, and if the rest of you want to take a moment to vote, and then we will share our results with everyone. So as these results are coming in, uh, Diane, it looks like most people are saying domestic violence is, is the number one choice that we're getting. Um, okay. Death being second. Natural disasters right. and medical or mental health conditions are coming in at a tie and then followed by community crime. So I'm going to go ahead and close this poll and then I will share this with everybody so you can see uh, the, the breakdown of how your colleagues have responded to this question. <clears throat> so what are your thoughts on this, Diane, about how people well, have responded? You know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. You know, if 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 I hadn't done any type of research on on trauma itself, or had an experience working um, uh, with trauma, uh, my response might have always tended towards what was the most dramatic of of let's say the choices. Uh, that were presented, I probably would have picked domestic violence itself as number one because, you know, inherently, even in the even in the title, violence, you know, it it rings uh, or it's kind of linked to trauma. But when I take a step back and I try to take myself out of the equation of uh, what I think trauma means, so what is it really? according to the experts. And I found this to be a very um, simple yet accurate definition of what trauma is. So it's basically an emotional response to a terrible event. And what that means is, 
or what that means to me is that a terrible event can be can be subjective, right? It's basically something that's in the eye of the beholder. It's a situation that will cause someone to be overwhelmed in their emotional response to what they're experiencing either directly or seeing. So I want to come back now to this original poll question we had. I think it was like four or five choices. And this is an expanded list of the types of situations that in theory could potentially be traumatic. Now where did I get this list? This is not the list. This is what I went through in my, in my own mind uh, based on the experiences that I've had in my personal life, my experience as an interpreter, and my experience as a clinician. The different types of situations that I've come in contact with uh, that could in theory be traumatic if in fact the definition is what it says, an emotional response to a terrible event. So if you look down this list, I guess I invite you now to kind of broaden your, your frame of reference and think about the experiences that you've encountered as an interpreter. Let's just start there. So I'm assuming, or I, I imagine, that domestic violence is something you may have come in contact with, let's say through work in the courts, or with emergency services, or even you know, in a healthcare situation. Um, exploitation, that could be human trafficking, right, uh, prostitution, uh, community crime, you know, that could be as a witness or a victim, right, natural disaster, certainly those are traumatic, war, civil unrest, genocide, you know, death, that's a traumatic experience. You know, this next one, the, you know, the medical and or mental health condition, I you know, I think about people people that I've known in my life who have been diagnosed with um, chronic conditions, while not life-threatening, uh, a diagnosis of, let's say, diabetes or um, some kind of, um, let's just say, kidney disease. Uh, I'm using, thinking of a specific example. That can be a very traumatic experience uh, for someone. And, you know, when I worked as an interpreter, an over-the-phone interpreter, and, and more recently in the last... Uh, I'm going to say eight years when I was still working with an OPI provider, you know, during the economic downturn, we took a lot of, we did a lot of work with people who were in foreclosure because they had lost their homes uh, or investments were going sour. Uh, so there was a lot of um, distress associated with financial adversity, being out of work, you know, loss of employment. You know, for some people that might not be uh, traumatic, but for some others it might be discrimination, addiction, you know, now we see like bullying and harassment more um, in the news, uh, like cyberbullying as well. So I am sure we could continue to add to this list of the experiences that really could be qualified as traumatic if our framework is that it's an emotional response to a terrible event. There are many different types of terrible events. Uh, and, and that people have emotional responses to. So what I, I guess to sum this up, a trauma response is a very personal experience and what might not affect me might very well affect you significantly. So I think it's always important that we exercise a level of sensitivity with the people around us and with ourselves that how we interpret, and pardon the pun, I, you know, how we interpret an event is very unique to us. And so that's the framework that I want to, wanted to start off with, that trauma can come in many shapes and sizes. So with that said, I wanted to shift now into the discussion of vicarious trauma. And this, I, I was kind of d debating about how I was going to present this and how I was going to say it. So I'm just going to say it exactly how it came to my mind and then qualify it. You know, in reality, trauma can be all around us. And 
it's not to make us, I'm certainly not trying to make anyone feel paranoid or hyper vigilant, but I want to have us have a, a broad perspective of where we could be encountering trauma. Because if we're more aware of where it could be coming from, then we're more likely to be uh, sensitive and mindful of how we could be affected uh, and not get, let's say, potentially blindsided. So I think it's important to be thinking, you know, I'm doing a, for example, these are examples, I'm going to be at a medical setting doing an interpretation today with someone who is going to get a really uh, serious diagnosis. Now I have to be careful because that, you know, that could be very, very hard and it could affect me. Now I might then be doing um, interpretation for uh, a, a foreclosure using this example from, from my past experience. That could also be very difficult, but if I'm not in the right mindset, I might not realize how that might affect me. So, you know, to, to, to kind of make that long story short, it's wise to be asking ourselves that question when we are doing our interpretation. How might this situation affect me versus, oh, that won't affect me because that's not a traumatic experience based on maybe a limited, uh, a limited frame of reference. So what is vicarious trauma? And Diane, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you just one second. Um, right below your webcam view, there's a little uh, green bar that says go to meeting is using this webcam. Is it possible to close that? There's that. Oh, yes. Excellent. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. You know, I think that, that vicarious trauma um, is probably something we, we really understand at this point, uh, but the breadth of it is really what, I, what I'd what i like to speak to. And I found this great, great depiction of what, it was great for me, let me say it that way. Uh, it really kind of uh, stuck with me that vicarious trauma is the emotional residue of situations uh, that we're exposed to when we work with other people and hear their stories. And I, I really love this, this visual image of like, residue. It's not something we go and we pick up. It's something that sticks to us when we pass through. Uh, and it's a, it's a great image for, for, for us to think about that what we come in or who we come in contact uh, with and the stories that we hear can stick with us. And I you know, want to qualify, th this isn't just for interpreters, right? I mean, obviously, we're doing this as a function of uh, CHIA, which is, you know, our, you know, healthcare interpreters. But, you know, can, you can imagine that any service provider that works with, with our LEP population, whether it's doctors, nurses, it might be first responders, it could be immigration officials or, you know, even bank representatives. Anyone that works with our LEP population has the, has the potential to also be uh, experiencing vicarious trauma. And so imagine that in a group of service providers, there, there could be a lot of different ways that people are experiencing the, the stories they're hearing. So I'm going to ask now that we do a little bit of an exercise, and it was a little um, it was a little easier when uh, I was in person with people in Long Beach, but I'm going to see how this goes here. I'm doing it uh, by by webinar. Take a piece of paper. Hopefully, I'll have a piece of paper uh, in front of you, uh, and just quickly uh, draw sort of or try to copy this shape. It's uh, just a uh, an outline of the human human body, because uh, we're going to do something with this. And as you're drawing, I'm going to um, explain the exercise that we're going to do. Um, I'd like you to think back about a particular uh, assignment that you had. And I'm not going to qualify it being, let's say, healthcare in particular. It might be, but it might have been some other type of assignment that you were on. Think back to that assignment that you know impacted you in a particular way. And what I'd like you to do is, if you can remember, 
write down the physical sensations that you felt in your body when you were experiencing, when you were in that particular experience. And write the, the, the physical symptom sort of where you felt it in your body. So if it was something in your hands, just jot down what you felt you know, in that area or in your legs, your stomach, your neck, because we're going to do something with this. Uh, and so uh, I appreciate it, kind of try to be flexible here with, with, this, uh, with this exercise. So I'm going to give you maybe a minute or two to write down the physical sensations and then we're going to uh, move forward. And as people are doing that, I would say as well, if you, if anybody wants to share uh, through the questions box some of their some of their thoughts about this too, we can we can share some of those online as well. And that that can be anonymous. We don't necessarily need to share your name, but we can share some of your experiences. So while you're doing that, I'm going to uh, share what I did for myself. Uh, that's me, if you can see the resemblance. Um, I did this uh, um, actually uh, a couple of months ago, right before the, the, uh, the conference in Long Beach, and I was able to, I'm fairly familiar with these symptoms, because so quite frankly, it didn't, didn't take me long to, to write this, but I definitely have very specific sense, like physical sensations, that um, I get when I'm in situations that are, that are, I'm going to qualify them as, let's say, traumatic. Not necessarily for me, uh, but even for others that I'm, you know, working with. So I, racing thoughts, um, chest tightness, I kind of have shallow breathing, my throat gets tight, I kind of feel like I'm going to choke a little bit. Uh, it's a sort of cold sensation. I guess for me the hallmark is when my teeth hurt um, and my jaw starts to feel really tight, that's a clear sign that something's going on. Um, and I know immediately that, mm, okay, i got to pay attention here. So I'm curious, if, Michelle, if, if anybody wants to, like I said, you don't have to say who you are, but even um, any physical sensations that you yourself feel in your body when you're faced with a situation that uh, is potentially traumatic. I would love to hear your feedback. And we did. We've had a couple of people write in. So one person said that he feels a big lump in his throat and that he's like he's fighting back tears. Uh, right. Another participant said that she will get a migraine headache immediately following an encounter. Mm. Okay. Okay. I know for myself, I tend to feel, you know, my throat, I'll be clearing my throat. And that that's when I, I don't notice a physical symptom, but after I realize that, you know, that I'm clearing my throat, it's not a pain or a discomfort, but then I'll realize that the, it feels tight. Right. You know, so right. Something all of a sudden will happen. Uh, we've got another participant says she gets tightness in her shoulders. Uh, people saying that they feel that they're, that they're just simply sad, fighting back tears, um, racing heart, tightening in the throat, um, people saying that they feel palpitations, um, having racing thoughts, coldness in their hands and legs. Right. Okay, absolutely. And, you know, I'm going to set the context in a little, you know, maybe in a, a, after we do this next sort of um, – portion of the exercise about what's actually going on physically. So what I'd like to ask you to do is now try to link these physical either sensations or physical um, reactions, let's say, to feelings that, that you think you might have been having at that time. So I'm going to share with you kind of as an example of what how I kind of took the physical manifestations and link them to feelings that I had. So for sure, when I got this whole set of symptoms going on, or it's not symptoms, but manifestations, I'm really afraid. Um, and I know that. Uh, I also feel, um, it's, and this is all, it's amazing because this is all very, like, almost instantaneous. Helpless, 
I feel like I'm alone. I could be in a room full of people, but somehow I feel that I'm alone. Uh, I might definitely feel anxious, and that's where you know all of these other symptoms, like especially in the chest area, come from. And I feel I couldn't come up with a better word than empty. Uh, that wasn't like wordy, but it's kind of like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But I couldn't figure out a way to express that. I suddenly get, like my mind goes blank, like I can't figure out what the next thing is I'm going to do. So take a minute to try to link these um, physical manifestations to some feelings, and I'd be really interested to hear what types of feelings you might be having when this is going on. And Diane, as you, as people are writing down their feelings and thinking this through, can you just maybe briefly explain what the benefit is when we name these emotions? There's, there's a lot coming out saying that just stating what you're feeling, just being able to identify it is very helpful. Well, absolutely. You know, I, I guess if I, I don't know if this is very clinical, but I, I know I can speak from personal experience. I, I have this immediate feeling like, oh my gosh, what's going on? What's happening to me? But by being able to name it, it helps contain, I mean, at least for me, and I can say this as well for, for you know, the clients that I work with, when you can name your feelings, one, it, 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 it sets a framework for, or a container. That's what we use a lot. Like Sometimes we need to have a framework to contain us. And I think that that's kind of maybe a left brain uh, sort of um, need where we need to have an understanding of what's actually happening. So by being able to name it and name it accurately or closely, we know what's happening. So if we know what's happening, then we, then we can help ourselves. If we don't know what's going on. Uh, we're still in the, like, me being anxious and, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? So there's really a definite benefit to being able to create a framework for ourselves. Does, does that answer the question? Absolutely. And I'm going to invite people to go to comment as they did um, about the feelings, just as the, uh, the emotional aspect, just as they did with the, the physical symptoms. Uh, and just to my own feedback to you, I really love this exercise because I, I think it, 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 it's so nice to be able to visualize and, and, and particularly putting it right on the body. I think that's such a, a really nice way to do this. Um, I, I've enjoyed doing this at the conference, and I, I enjoy that you have us doing this here uh, and the webinar as well. I think it's, 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 a, it's a nice activity to, to really uh, to think about it, number one, because most of us don't, I think. But then also, like I say, to just to kind of look at it and, and really see what's happening. And I think then that that makes you the next time it happens, you're more aware of it. So, you know, I've got a couple of comments back from participants. One said that she feels very sad. Um, and another person says that um, that in particular with young patients, it reminds him of his own family members. Uh, and loved ones, and that that can make him feel sentimental, nostalgic, um, sometimes fearful for their family's health and well-being. Um, others say that they they sometimes even been brought to tears that they have cried. So a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, feelings here being expressed. That's wonderful, and you know I I want to invite. You, this is not an exercise that typically, you know, certainly I wouldn't have done this with myself if I hadn't been thinking about, um, thinking about uh, presenting to a group. But it was very, very beneficial, and it really put me in a position where I had to really con get really accurate about what I was feeling. One of the things that I that I uh, that I talk about on my blog, and I'll and I'll put. I have my um, blog uh, sort of address at the end, and you'll be able to kind of go and access some of those resources. Is you know when we work when we work with kids uh, uh, in our office, you know kids have sort of a limited vocabulary of the way that they express their feelings. And I don't know if anybody's seen this movie Inside Out, but you know they name um, uh, very specific emotions that kids, in sort of a more concrete way, can 
can identify with, like joy, sadness, I think there's disgust, uh, fear, and anger, and there's one more. Um, I, I can't think of the other one right now, um, but, but very kind of limited uh, to help them get away from saying I don't know when we talk to them about, you know, how are they feeling about the experiences they have. But I would invite us as a group of, you know, adult language professionals to really um, be broader in the way that we express how we feel. Uh, there's, if you, at the end, uh, like I said, I'll show, give you the address of the blog, but you can go, and I have a, on the blog a, a, an emotions wheel, it's like, a, and it has a variety of um, much more, uh, much broader uh, set of uh, names for different emotions. Because I think the more accurate we can be about the way we're feeling, uh, the more likely we can be to come up with a really good self-care plan. So, you know, we speak at least two languages, everybody on this call, right? At least two, probably some of us more. So there are many ways to express emotions, sometimes more beautifully in one language than another. So I would invite you to spend some time really thinking about um, how you're feeling, and is it really the first feeling that you identify? And the, really, the reason I bring that up is that when I tend to work with adult, uh, adult uh, clients, um, uh, in, in, you know, my, my monolingual or English-speaking, um, uh, English-Spanish-speaking clients, uh, typically p people tend to say that they're angry, right? They go kind of for the strong emotion. When in fact, it's not always angry. It could be sadness. It could be despair. It could be frustration, sadness. So, you know, if you find that you immediately go to a word, you know, I would say ask yourself, is it really that or is it something else? Uh, so with that said, um, I want to go on or kind of take a step back so we can take a step forward, which is what's actually going on physically for us. Uh, when we have all these body sensations going on. So this is kind of like a funny little uh, depiction I saw of what we, what we know as the fight or flight response, right? So it's really fight, flight, or freeze. So the reason I'm, and this, this little guy is kind of creepy looking, but I, that was the best depiction I could, I could find uh, with all of these symptoms uh, associated with the experience. So. I would imagine that many of us are, are familiar with this fight or flight, but basically this is a, like a primitive response that's built into our system or our physiology where our brain, our, our primitive brain, you know, the amygdala, is able to perceive a potential threat. You know, back in the old days, it was, you know, uh, dinosaurs chasing me or some, you know, I'm, I'm in danger of being eaten by some, you know, man-eating uh, woolly mammoth, let's say. You know, not much of that going on these days, but our brain still perceives threat, right? So when we're in a situation, whether it's truly something that's putting us um, in a danger or not, our brain might perceive it that way. And then there's a physiological response because what's happening is we've got a lot of stress hormones that are rushing through our body, whether it's, you know, adrenaline because I've got to like get away from, get away from, you know, this threat. So that's kind of what could be getting our, you know, thoughts racing, our, you know, the blood's rushing away from our extremities. You know, for me, my, my hands, my arms, my legs, feet get really cold. Well, that's like the blood, the blood washing away. And it, what it's doing is it's coming to our core to protect our, you know, our, like all the important stuff, right, is, is in our torso. And, you know, back, like I said, when, you know, for cavemen, that was important. They really needed to be able to protect their core against, um, you know, physical danger. Now, you know, because it's our primitive brain, a threat is a threat, Well, whether it's a dinosaur or it's, you know, uh, being involved in something traumatic that's more um, on a visual level, our, it doesn't differentiate because our physical sensation is the same. So it's important to understand what's happening physically. That, and I've heard, well actually I've said it, it's not that I've just heard it, oh my gosh, I'm going crazy. And I, and I, and I, and I shouldn't say that because I'm in the profession of working with people in a clinical setting, but that's sometimes the first thing that comes out of my mouth when I'm talking to myself, I'm going crazy. And I'm not going crazy, I'm having a physiological response to 
to a perceived threat. Or it's what I perceive. And remember we talked about this being a very um, personal experience. So there's no uh, uh, like instruction, not instruction manual, but like a checklist, like everybody's going to feel the same way based on what they see. Uh, there's so many factors, personal factors, like history of, you know, personal history, um, who you're working with, uh, that, that can go into how you perceive things. So at the end of the day, if if you're feeling like this, that's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter if anybody else is feeling this way. It's what you feel. So without digressing too much into physiology, this gives you a sense of why you are feeling the way you are. Something actually physical is going on. Now, I, you know, Michelle, I don't know if anybody has any comments about the, this yet that have come in. Before I move on, I don't want to just race off this slide if anybody has a, has a comment or a question. No comments yet, but if any come in, then I'll let you know, and we can maybe come back to it. During okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. So we're going back to this this concept of toxic residue. You know, we talked about or this definition of uh, vicarious trauma being the uh, the like the emotional residue that sticks with us after we've experienced um, some something traumatic or witnessed something traumatic. These are once again, this is just the list stormed with myself of different types of feelings or experiences that I have had in the course of my work either as an interpreter or, you know, as a clinician. And quite frankly, even things in my personal life that I've seen um, or experienced other people going through. So, I mean, if you look through this, this is quite a list of residual feelings that you know, I'll say for me that I have had over the course of, I can't even just say my career, my life. So I'm curious if anybody has any other types of residual feelings that they don't see listed here, um, apart from, you know, the ones that I, that I have experienced myself. Um, anything that anybody else can think of? Because this is quite a load to have, right? And every situation can cause us to feel different ways. Uh, and once again, everything isn't about being angry or being afraid or sad. Sometimes it's confusion. Sometimes it's just utter, you know, horror is the best way I can put it. You know, I work in the field of childhood trauma right now, and some of these situations are just, you know, even leaves me a little bit speechless, but horrific. Uh, not powerless. That's not a... Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, sorry, yes, we've got a few people commenting uh, fatigue, tremors, depression. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, you know, these are things that we're human beings, right? That's why we got into this field because we want, well, I'm assuming, right, that we got into this field because we wanted to do something to help others. But we're not immune to the things that we experience. Uh, and be, especially being an interpreter, you are actually, if you are interpreting for someone, you are taking on, or we are taking on their identity for a moment in time, right? Even though we're, you know, we're neutral, we're not advocates for our, you know, our clients, we're their voice. And so, you know, our brain doesn't necessarily distinguish between, you know, who's who. When we're talking, let's say, in the first person, you know, and I don't know how many people can, can relate to this, but if I say, as an interpreter, you know, I was raped. You know, he beat me and raped me and left me for dead. You know, I'm not sure my brain in that moment recognizes that I'm the interpreter, right? I'm not the person. There is a certain... Um, I guess, and I'm just thinking this now as I'm talking, like a temporary transfer of identity uh, that can happen, that can be really very, very um, moving, and uh, can, it can really have an impact on us. So with that said, any other residual feelings that have come in uh, apart from what's been shared so far before I move on? Feeling anxious is one, and uh, going back a little bit, but I think it re it relates to this slide as well. That uh, somebody commented that sometimes there's you have a feeling of confusion, and it just takes a while to figure out how to react to something. Right, 
Right. It, it's like this. The way I kind of look at this is is almost like system overload when you don't, you know, kind of like you're 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 just so overwhelmed by what you've seen or heard that you kind of go blank from I don't know. It probably feels a lot longer than it actually is, but it's just this blank, confused feeling. Almost, what do I do? Uh, and that's the numbness that I referred to here as well. So. You know, I think it's important for us to spend the remainder of our time talking about what can we actually do with this. I think by now we've all got a clear sense of, you know, the trajectory that we follow when we come to being able to say, yes, I, I have experienced vicarious trauma. Um, and one caveat, you know, we can experience vicarious trauma, I think, in, the, in a couple of ways. You know, we can experience it based on one particular scenario that we've been involved in uh, that's been truly um, traumatic, or there can be a cumulative effect over time. Well, not or, it's probably and. It's, it can be you know, one-time experience as well as the cumulative effect of experiencing you know, or going through assignments, let's say, that are, what's the word? I don't want to, not ad, um, adverse that have a sort of an adverse nature to them. So I think it's important for us to keep in mind that this could have two layers uh, from an individual assignment level as well as a cumulative. But I do want to distinguish between vicarious trauma and burnout before we actually get into how can we help ourselves. And I'm sure, and I've heard it actually, I've probably said it myself, inter you know, use these terms inter changeably, if that's a word, or I've exchanged those terms, vicarious trauma, oh, I'm so burned out, I'm worn out, I'm burned out, I'm, you know, this has been really traumatic, but they really are different things. Vicarious trauma is really, once again, we've talked about that, the impact of having um, listened to, and in our case, as interpreters repeated the stories of trauma survivors, and it affects us on a multiple, you know, multiple levels. Burnout is is, and I'm not saying burnout is not important or is not significant, but it's not the same type of, doesn't pack the same punch, so to speak, on an emotional level. You know, I could be, you know, filing papers, let's say, for a living and get burned out if I'm doing that over and over and over again. That's not vicarious trauma. That's um, burnout from repetition. So if I were to change my job, let's say, I might be able to alleviate that. So I think... It's when you hear people use the term vicarious trauma, uh, just in your own mind, you know, it's not the same thing as burnout. Um, it, it's not. Uh, and, and, you know, you can take a look at the screen and the different sort of um, descriptors to, to see the difference. But uh, for the purposes of our discussion and vicarious trauma, so, you know, what are we going to actually do about it? Because it's uh, certainly not my goal to have you leave today's webinar with this load of, traumatic experiences that you might have experienced and not have a sense of, okay, how can I help myself? So, you know, I'm a very strong believer in the mind-body connection and uh, uh, helping, trying to address things on different levels, okay? And I, I think that one without the other, uh, and this is a personal opinion, uh, one without the other doesn't quite do it. So if we can look at a self-care plan, which I really ha believe has to be personalized because there's no template for what's going to work for everybody. We have to, you know, help ourselves on, uh, help ourselves on different levels. So I'm going to invite you now to do another qu uh, poll question about what your current self-care practices are. Okay? And once again, this is not the list. This is just brainstorming that I did with myself about different things that I do or have heard other people do. So, Michelle, um, if you want to uh, kind of frame this uh, as to how many questions I can actually vote on. Sure. And so we've got um, five choices out of this list. We summarized a couple, uh, but we have here, how do you take care of yourself? Sleep? nourishing food, exercise, religious practice, or socializing with family and friends. So, you know, maybe you may do more than one of these, but if you pick maybe your top one uh, that you that you practice the most. 
And as Diane said, with her list, she's got a lot more options there, and there are probably things that people do that are not listed. And in fact, if you do something that you don't see on a larger list, once we go back to that, feel free to share that with us as well uh, in your question comment box. And we've got about 75% of the people have have um, have replied so far, and I'll I'll let a few more of you uh, reply before we close this out. But it looks like we're getting equal responses for sleep and socializing with friends and family. So about 25% of of our participants for each of those. And then sort of equally split between nourishing food, exercise, and religious practice. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. It looks like everybody who wants to vote has done so. So I will close this and I'll share this on the screen so everybody can kind of take a look at that. Um, and again, um, you know, once we go back to, um, to Diane's slide now, we can see the long, larger list that she's got available. And uh, maybe some folks have thought of other ideas. Wonderful. And, you know, I have to qualify this. This isn't all the stuff I do. I mean, I, these are, this is just like a long list of, of, of potential ideas. And, you know, one thing I would say is it's important to be realistic. When I look, you know, do I always eat nourishing food? Well, probably not. You know, sometimes when I'm stressed out or anxious, there's nothing like a good bowl of ice cream. I mean, that's like actually my go-to, right, when I'm feeling like I need a little bit of, like, self-care. You know, I don't know that that qualifies as nourishing, but it's comforting. Um, sleep, I'm a big believer in that. And I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on sleep and what it does for us, but I, d I have done uh, a certain amount of reading that sleep is a is a is a really powerful way for us to um, replenish obviously our body and process our stress and it's the way our brain um, processes information and shifts it from the short term memory to the long term memory so that's really important um, whether it be you know making sure you get a good night's sleep or even if you need like a what do they call it like a cat nap um, to give yourself an opportunity to have plenty of plenty of rest. Uh, and so, you know, even in the, when I'm working with clients uh, in, in my practice, you know, particularly for people who, let's say, are experiencing a, a anxiety and depression, you know, maybe can't get out of bed or really can't muster up the energy, you know, there becomes this, well, what happened here? Um, oh, sorry. And there, what, what happens is, uh, that people start to start to uh, disengage, I would say, from activities that they uh, have previously enjoyed, and that's actually one of the signs of depression. It's something called anhedonia, which is basically lack of interest um, in in activities uh, uh, that bring bring pleasure. Let's say so. You know, whatever I, I've always. I always qualify this. Whatever works for you is what you 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 should do, um, and whether it works for someone else is, quite frankly, irrelevant. If it works for you and it helps you uh, get back to sort of a grounded place, then that's something you want to do more of. If something's not working, stop doing it, um, because. There's nothing. There's no benefit from continuing to try uh, to do an activity that's just not doing it for you. Uh, and I'm just going to use yoga. That's an example, and this is like a little bit of a funny example. I thought, well, that's what's going to be good because it's good for other people I know. Well, you know, quite frankly, I, I just not did not like it, but I kept doing it because I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll come to like it. Well, in the end, it was giving me more stress, and I thought, well, there's no point in having more stress if I'm trying to de-stress. So stop doing that and start doing something else. But moving away from the physical uh, portion of sort of self-care routine, I want to come back to tending, tending to the mind because I really believe, uh, and I believe this even before I went into sort of my current field of work, that the mind is kind of where it all starts and our body can manifest things that, are, that, that we've got going on in our mind that we haven't been able to process. So I want to go back to my little self depiction, not only the physical sensations, uh, but also the, the feelings. One of the, thing, the first things I had asked you was to trace it back, to trace those 
physical manifestations back to some feelings. And I'm a very strong believer in where did this come from, right? What does it mean? It's only a feeling. It's not a judgment about yourself. It's, it, it, and this is easier for me to say than, than do sometimes, but not to be scared by the feeling, like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling anxious, but to try to find out what is causing it. Be mindful of asking, using the word why, not because why is inherently a bad word, it's just a word, but sometimes the way that a question that starts with why is delivered or perceived can be judgmental. Uh, have, and I'm assuming, I mean, it, that have people have heard others say to you, well, why are you feeling like that? Right? And that's, that's never a good feeling. Like, well, I am, right? But when there comes this question and there's sort of a, an attitude with it or a facial gesture, it's, there's this, you shouldn't be feeling like that. Or even if I ask myself, well, geez, Diane, why are you feeling like this? It's different than saying, okay, all right, I'm feeling like this. Where is this coming from? One is a more judgmental way to um, approach a situation. The other is more of um, kind of an inquiry. It goes, it's kind of like doing a little bit of investigative reporting, which if you really want to, to, to be in the self-help sort of frame of mind, it's good to figure out what's going on. And if you can figure out what's going on, once again, you're not trying to, or we're not trying to um, beat it into submission or make it go away. We're trying to welcome it in and say, okay, I'm feeling anxious alone, you know, fearful. Then I can question about, okay, well, what can I do about it versus try to shame myself into not feeling that way. So any questions or comments about this before we move off the, before we move sort of away from um, how to help ourselves figure out what we're feeling and where it's coming from? Anything, Michelle? I don't see anything as of yet. Okay. All right. So this is then linked to a more, uh, I don't know if the word is ambiguous, but a more kind of um, intangible uh, element of who we are and our persona, which is our spirit, and it's the things that we can't see. And I'm a very, uh, once again, big believer in sort of um, the voices that we hear, or the voice that we use and the voice that we hear. Uh, And there's an internal voice that I'm sure we all have. I mean, I know mine is alive and well. And sometimes that voice can be very nurturing and sometimes that voice can be um, not so not so nurturing it can be hurtful to me and these are once again this isn't the the whole list but if I were going to look at the way that my own internal voice can work sometimes it can be very nurturing but sometimes it can be in the process of minimizing what I'm going on and what's going on I might be saying to myself I don't make such a big deal out of this thing, and it's, it's really not a big deal. You always blow things out of proportion. Now, this is what I'm saying to myself. These aren't things that I would ever, ever say to somebody else, but I'm willing sometimes to say it to myself before I catch what I'm doing, right? So I minimize my experience. Now, in the moment, maybe I do that as kind of a survival technique because it's not appropriate or I'm not in a place where I can, you know, kind of let myself uh, go through the process. But if it's really more of a practice that I'm engaged in of making less of my experience, that's certainly not going to help me um, be able to process what I'm feeling. And if I truly believe that what I'm feeling is um, important, then making light of it or less of it is certainly not um, helpful. But it can, be, it can almost be an automatic response. Self-deprecating is another way that... We can hurt ourselves, like saying, oh, Diane, you know, you're so, you're so stupid for feeling like this. Why do you feel like this? You always do this. You're such a crybaby. Once again, things I would never say to anybody else, but I find myself at times saying those kinds of things to myself. And 
you know, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. Sometimes I could be my own worst enemy. So uh, I, I just call your attention to the ways that you talk to yourself. Are you even aware of the things that you say to yourself? Um, I'm pretty aware right now of how I talk to myself. Doesn't mean I don't do it. I'm not certainly, you know, uh, cured of this. I do it, but I catch myself. And when I catch myself, then the damage I can do is much less. And then there's the external voice, and and it was a way I tried to capture the the way that our the influences around us can impact us. And that's a pretty broad term. It could be social influences, familial, cultural, um, professional, um, anything that's outside of us, basically. It could be the media that sends us a message about who we are, how we're reacting. Now, and these are just some examples. You know, I guess the first most powerful one that I can think of would be you know, the norms within our families or in our cultures about the way we're supposed to react to things uh, or not react to things. So here I am talking about, you know, expressing ourselves, identifying the way that we feel and how it impacts us. You know, I personally, I mean, I came from a very loving family, but our kind of family norm was, you know, you don't talk about things. You don't share, you know, that kind of like, you don't talk about what's going on to people outside of outside of the family. You deal with it. You you be, you know, independent and self-sufficient. And so that was a message despite being in a very loving family. So kind of growing up thinking, okay, I gotta figure out how I'm gonna deal with this on my own, or I'm just not gonna even acknowledge it. Those can be really powerful and sometimes we don't even realize um, where they come from. Or if we try to change it, it's like, well, how do we change that without feeling like we're rejecting where we came from? So that kind of family and cultural um, rooting can be really uh, uh, very powerful. So I would say also, what kind of messages did you get about uh, expressing yourself, about being able to feel things? Are there certain things that you're able to feel, like anger versus you know, maybe sort of softer feelings? Uh, like sadness or vulnerability, you know, could be gender norms. It, it's a really fascinating type of uh, uh, exploration to do. And once again, it's not a value judgment. It's really almost like you're going to kind of do like a research, uh, research project on, you know, how did I get to be who I am and why I believe the things I do. And then when you understand it, you can do something about it. Or, or not. It's, it, there's no um, obligation, but it's good to have, once again, a framework. Um, also, and these are some funny ones. Well, I don't know. They're not actually not funny, but they're um, interesting. The sort of this poor you. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where, you know, you kind of muster up the courage to tell someone how you're feeling, and you get the kind of, oh, you know, poor you. Oh, it's, I'm so sorry for you. You know, I've never felt like that, but, you know, poor you. And it's, it's a way to kind of make someone feel uh, superior. Uh, whether it's conscious or unconscious that they do it, they minimize you so that they, they feel better. Um, so, you know, that's something that, that, you know, here you are sharing something, and then you come away with something else to make you feel uh, not so good. Um, the frenemy, uh, the person you think is going to be there for you, but who, who you share something with. And um, they they they, they kind of do you wrong. They don't they don't support you in the way that you need to, or or actually um, discount or disregard what you're saying. Uh, and then obviously you can always have an external voice that's very supportive. And those are the kinds of uh, influences that are the ones you you know would be ideal to have those in your life. So if you were going to tend to your spirit, you know. Here would be, you know, this is kind of my, the way I look at it for, for myself. Once again, how am I talking to myself? Am I saying things that are hurting me or helping me? And once again, am I always like, and I think I've said this, I'm not always so nurturing. But, you know, I'm more nurturing now with myself than I was before I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and I think that's something we achieve or sh uh, strive for, I would say. Tell your story, including to yourself. And I know Michelle had said, you know, had said earlier, you know, is there a benefit to talking about? It? Absolutely, there is absolutely a benefit. 
Um, I know for me, sometimes when it's up in my mind, it takes on a different sort of um, uh, volume and uh, uh, gravity than when I actually talk about it out loud. And I, you know, um, there's this saying in English, and I'm sure there's something similar in other languages, like misery loves company. You know, I, that's kind of a negative spin, but you know, as humans, we look for connection. So when we're suffering, sometimes we shut down, right? Um, and you know, one of the things that can happen when people are experiencing some kind of distress, emotional distress, is they disengage. They disengage from you know the world around them, um, partially or totally. So by telling your story, it's a way of reconnecting, and I think that's very important. At the same time, you know, pick your audience well. And I've learned this the hard way myself. Sometimes I'm just so so desperate to kind of tell my story that I just when I was like sort of pop it out to whoever you know whoever happens to be there. And you know, once again, that can uh, that can backfire. And so be really mindful. You don't have to have a hundred people. You don't even have to have ten people. If you've got one person that you can go to, or two people, or you know there's a resource. It doesn't have to be friends or family. It may be, for example, um, you know, someone in your workplace or someone, maybe it's a therapist, maybe it's someone through like EAP at your, um, you know, in your uh, employer, or maybe it's a peer debriefer if you happen to work in a place where, you know, you have a critical incident stress debriefing. But, you know, be mindful of who you tell your story to because I think when people share their stories, it's a gift they're giving. You're giving someone a gift by letting them see and hear what's going on inside. So if you're going to tell it to someone who's going to disregard the gift, then that is ultimately going to hurt you. Also, tell it at a time and a place that you're not rushing around. You know, you're trying to create the environment and it, you, you know, within which to tell your story. And I'm certainly not suggesting over-engineering, but once again, you're giving a gift. Uh, by a uh, part of yourself. So you want to try to do the best you can to um, to set the environment up right for yourself. And you know this last one, this is something I've learned. You know, people aren't psychics either and don't don't have a crystal ball about what I need. So I've learned, uh, and I have uh, you know a friend in particular, a couple of friends who, you know, sometimes I have to say, okay, I'm just gonna tell you this story. Um, don't react. Don't you know? Maybe you could just be a little soft with me today because I'm feeling a little bit uh, less able to hear it bluntly. But if you could just listen, or you know, do you know, listen or say whatever you're going to say in, in a particular way. Sometimes that helps because one day I might be really able to hear something very directly and bluntly, and then the next day, for whatever reason, I'm feeling a little bit more emotional and not, uh, or a little bit more close to tears and, and not able to, you know, kind of get the direct message. So, you know, in, in, in deference to our, our support network, you know, let them know what's going to work best for you. And if they're really your good friends, they're uh, going, to, going to help you. So here we're kind of coming to the end now. And these are what I would say would be the key takeaways. This is real. And I think we all know it, and it's okay to say it out loud. It doesn't make us weak. It doesn't make us uh, in, um, incompetent or un, you know, unable to do our jobs. It's real, and we're human. As we talked about, there's just a physiological process that's going on. So we're wired to perceive and react to threats. But we have the opportunity, and I probably shouldn't have used the word control, but we have the opportunity to shape. I guess that would have been a better way to say it. Shape how we process our reaction uh, so that it'll help us. And I'm a firm believer that, you know what, pretending it's not there doesn't make it go away. Sooner or later, whatever we resist comes back. And it can come back stronger if we've resisted a variety of things and then they all pile up and they come out. So we, you know, maybe gaining something in the short term, but in the long term, you know, it always comes back in some way. And finally, I would say, find out what works for you. We've done a lot of different sort of brainstorming about different things that are self-care. Once again, we're all different, so different things are going to work for us. And 
different things will work for us in our own lives. What worked for me 10 years ago is not going to work for me today. And it may not work for me next week, next month, next year. That's okay. So be thinking about what's going to feel right for you. So with that, that we're, we're coming to the end uh, of, our, of our webinar. I wanted to let you know that um, here's my contact, uh, contact information, uh, my email, both at, uh, my personal email as well as my, my work email, and then uh, my, uh, my blog uh, address that you can go to. I have a homework assignment uh, for you. Uh, and this is a homework assignment you're going to do for yourself. It's not something you have to turn in for me. Um, and Michelle has this handout loaded uh, in, the, in the webinar platform. I want you to think about one thing that you have not done for yourself in the spirit of self-care that you would like to do, that you haven't done yet, that you would like to do. Make a commitment to what you're going to do and when you're going to do it within the next, let's say, three to four days, by the end of the weekend. Today's Thursday. By the end of the weekend, one new self-care practice that you can do for yourself on behalf of yourself. Uh, and this handout that I'm sending you is not about more vicarious trauma information. It's about self-care. And it kind of breaks us down into different domains, uh, physical, psychological, emotional, professional, spiritual, and personal. So pick one thing, just one thing that you can commit to and know you're going to do and make a commitment. So there's a reason I'm saying that, because the more specific we are about our goals and give ourselves a timeline, the more likely we are to do them versus, yeah, I'll get to it, yeah, I'll think of something and I'll do it some, you know, someday, somehow. Pick one thing and pick a time where you can commit to yourself. And feel free to write to me, let me know, you know, what you did, how it helped you. Um, you know, it, uh, I always like to hear what people do um, to help themselves. And it is a challenge. Uh, pick something. Because this is not really a passive process. Self-care is not just like something you think about, right? It's something you actually have to do something about. So with that, and there's some um, time now that we have. It's just actually 11.15. That was like perfect, and I didn't plan it. We've got some time for questions. If anybody has a question uh, for me or for Michelle, we'd love to, you know, questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Diane. We do have um, uh, a couple of questions here. So one goes back to... Are you there, Michelle? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Michelle? Okay? Yes, I'm here. I am here. Can you hear me? We may have lost audio. Let's see. Michelle? Yes, I'm here. Diane, do you hear me now? Are you there? I am. It sounds, I'm wondering if everybody else can hear us. We may be having some technical difficulty here. Is everybody able to hear our audio? I'm not sure if it was Michelle. Yes, I'm here.
testing, testing. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, hi Diane, can you hear me? Oh, hi. <laughs> okay, I'll so you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. So okay. I, I guess I'm curious, Are where you, did, did you, were you able to hear me through the end of the presentation? Because at some point it got silent. Yes. Oh, perfect. Yay. <laughs> I was thinking I was going to have to go back. All right. It's wonderful. So I can't hear you, um, but I guess if you want to type me the questions, if there's any questions or comments, that may be a good workaround. So the question is, how does tracing it back help with self-care? You know, I'm going to use the experience I have um, working, you know, in my clinical setting. Uh, it's important to for people to understand kind of the root of uh, why they're feeling the way they feel. I use the word why, okay, and I don't use that in a judgmental way. I'm just using it because it's the it's the word that comes to mind. Because it's important to understand what sort of the, the process was to get to how I'm feeling. So for example, and I'm going to use a particular example. I did an assignment and this will illustrate, this is not to make it about me, but this will illustrate what I'm I'm talking about. I did an assignment. This is the one interpretation assignment that I think um, has affected me my entire life uh, without exaggerating and it was it happened in July of 1995 so that's 21 years ago I was doing an interpretation assignment um, at a local health clinic so this was an, um, a face-to-face -face assignment and the, the client or the LEP was a young mother of a, a baby um, and uh, she the baby was 18 months old had uh, cerebral palsy and so she was uh, talking to uh, the, the healthcare provider and the baby was laying you know on the on the, the exam table and I got very very emotional I mean first of my I got sort of tears in my eyes the mother was crying and it's the one experience um, that uh, I've ever had where I actually cried uh, and I made sort of a face because obviously I have this kind of like oh gosh I shouldn't do that but it happened I cried the healthcare provider cried, cried. And so I had to kind of figure out, okay, what was going on for me? Um, why was I so affected? You know, it didn't take me long to trace it back. The baby that I was, you know, seeing in the exam room was 18 months old. I had had a, I had my own child. He was the same age. She had a bunch of dark hair. My son had a bunch of dark hair. There were physical similarities. Um, the mom was very upset about um, the baby's diagnosis or, you know, chronic condition. And I just remember it tied back to all of my own anxiety about having a healthy baby. She was a single mother. I was a single mother. So, you know, when I spent some time kind of tracing it back, I understood, and it didn't take me long, like I said, to trace it back. It didn't take me days or weeks or months is it set the context of why I was feeling vulnerable to a particular situation. So I also believe that sometimes the things that are going, in our, going on in our personal lives can make us more vulnerable at different times in our lives uh, because there may be a parallel process going on uh, that, that could happen. So, you know, am I saying we always have to trace it back? Well, no, of course not. But if, you know, there are ways that, that, um, that we can, it could also help us in the future, right? So, you know, if I were to, let's say, at that time, gone on to interpret other assignments for, you know, single mothers of babies who are 18 months old, you know, I might be able to, what would be the word? I was going to say shield. I don't mean it like that in like a distancing myself way. I guess I do and I don't. 
I don't mean distancing myself not being human. I think we all need boundaries um, so that, you know, everything doesn't stick to us in the same way. So I think it's, it's kind of like knowledge is power. If that, I mean, that's like a way long answer to this question, but knowledge is power. And if I know what's happening for me, I can help myself in the future. So I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure. Can you hear me now? I'm right. going to keep trying. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think it's important, uh, once again, you know, by any means, don't, don't um, interpret what I'm saying as this is what you have to do. No, not at all. I'm going to reiterate, um, you guys have to figure out what's going to work best for you. I'm just sharing a different possibilities of the things that you might find helpful. Once again, it may not be helpful. Um, you might find that there are things that aren't even, that we didn't even talk about today that, that benefit you. So, you know, they're, they're kind of like the most commonly used uh, ones, but certainly not the only one. So, once again, just like I said, my final point, find what works for you because that's the only thing that's going to be effective. Well, you know, I guess as we sort of wind up today, you know, what makes this whole um, topic really important? What can happen to us? Uh, if we don't take time for self-care, you know, the way I look at it, and I'm going to talk about this for myself personally, I want to be able to do two things. One, I want to be able to stay in the profession that I chose for as long as I choose to stay in. If I don't take care of myself, I won't have the energy, the, the physical energy, the mental energy to continue to do what I do. I don't want to have to make a, you know, end my career prematurely or have to do something else because I didn't take care of myself well, right? So I can be in it for the long term. And I think also on a more real-time level, if we don't take care of ourselves, it can affect, you know, our physical health. I mean, if you do some reading about um, vicarious trauma, you know, you can have, and I heard people say depression, anxiety, um, different, different types of um, ways that the things that we hear can affect us. I mean, it can affect our physical health, affects our mental health, it affects the people around us. You know, I don't want to come home and be angry or cranky or upset with my loved ones. I want to also be able to enjoy my life. So if I don't take care of what needs to be taken care of, it will have a, a ripple effect uh, in, uh, in my home, with my family, with my friends, uh, and that's not a legacy I want to pass on, and I'll say for myself, to, to my child, right? I, I, I want to, you know, want to be in it for as long as I can be in it and be satisfied, and I can only do that if I take care of myself. You know, and I'm curious uh, also, you know, what type of um, forums, you know, I'd be curious what kind of forums exist for, for interpreters to kind of, I guess for, this is, I don't know, this is not like a technical term, but like blow off steam with each other. Um, I think that's really important. You know, I'm very mindful of not coming home and, you know, dumping this on my family because one, they don't really have the experience to be the container for my for my, you know, stuff. So talking to other people is um, really, uh, talking to other people that have experienced something similar, maybe not ex exactly the same thing, is very beneficial. You know, when I worked um, as an over-the-phone interpreter, we had a, a critical incident uh, stress debriefing team that we were able to call after uh, traumatic calls, and I found that very beneficial. It was real time, uh, and I was able to talk to someone who, who had the experience, not only um, in helping debrief, but also as an interpreter. But I also think, you know, I don't know if you have any online forums that you can use. Or um, association meetings to use that time. You don't necessarily need to do it every day or every week, but even if you attend professional association meetings, let's say every quarter, 
you know, all of those things are contributions uh, to to self care. And if, like I said, even if in your um, place of employment, let's say you work in a healthcare system, that's just an example. You know, I would bring that up to see if that's something that you and your colleagues could 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 convene um, these kinds of opportunities to, to, to blow off some steam and, steam and decompress. It's very important, very important. Uh, and, I'm, you know, first responders have those types of experiences. I know at the health department um, where there's been a critical incident, there's a critical incident team that will um, talk to uh, not just, you know, obviously clinicians, but also first responders. So, you know, in your organization, it's, if you don't have it, you should, you should really um, raise the flag because it's something very important. Is, can anybody hear me? Can you hear me? 